Okay, let's start. Everyone. The most good morning. Glenn Close is the we have the pleasure of having Glenn Close with us. The enormous and immense pleasure of having Glenn Close with us, the Donosti Award winner for this year. Please, photographers, could you please now sit down? And during the rest of the press conference, please do not take any more photos if you'd be so kind. The press conference is going to be as follows. First of all, 25 minutes with Glenn Close, who will answer your questions, and then subsequently the director and the producer of the film will come in and answer your questions. So therefore, photographers, please uh, finish off with your work now, and please sit down. So therefore, let's commence the press conference. Microphone here in the front row, please, immediately. Yes. We have a first question. And I'll... And I'll take your... Hi, good morning. Welcome to San Sebastian. Congratulations for the award and for your career in general, obviously. Um, I would like to ask you two questions. The first of these is, I understand that in the 1980s you played the role of Albert Nobbs as well, is that right? Uh, I would like to know what differences, or how did you confront the, the role then and now? And the second question is a curiosity that I've had for many years. Since I saw Hook by Steven Spielberg, you play a little cameo there. As a man as well, okay, as a little pirate, as a pirate, how was that? So, the first question is, yes, I played Albert Nobbs for the first time on stage, off-Broadway, in 1982, so that's 29 years ago. Um, the play had been adopted from the short story by Simone de Musa, who was a wonderful French director. Um, and it was very austere, uh, very minimalist, a lot of mind, and a uh, very pure story. And so the exercise of, of recreating it for, for a film, uh, we had to fill out, fill out everything. Um, and that was another question. Oh, Hook. <laughs> um, I had visited uh, the set because Robin Williams is a friend of mine. And my little girl, Anna, was about three or four years old. And we went on the set, and Steven Spielberg said, Would you, Do you want to be a pirate? And I said, Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> they put chest hair on me, and they put a, a beard, and uh, it was very funny. The script girl. Um, uh, came on to me. She thought I was a man. So <laughs> nobody knew for three days that I was that I was uh, going close. I had a lot of fun. Yeah. Congratulations for this great performance. Um, two questions. Uh, there was always or often a touch of the masculine in your film characters. Not only this one, but nevertheless, you once said that you never wanted to be a man because you feel sorry for them. So why do you feel sorry for us? And the second question refers to something your daughter once said. She said that um, children always want everything of you. They are like clients. Now you've been a single parent, um, and a working parent. How did you balance your obligations, your professional obligations, and your duties as a mother? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm tired, so there was two questions. The first one? Oh, you don't want to feel for me. <laughs> um, uh, I think, I don't know if I still feel sorry for me. It's, you, know, you make a statement and then for the next 20 years, you know, people bring it back to you. Um, I think men and women are incredibly different. And I think women are much more complex maybe than men. And that men, you know, you have to deal with us for your whole life. So maybe in that way, you know, I'm proud to be a woman, but I understand, you know, the, uh, the, tr the trickiness of, of men and women together. I, right now, I am I'm very happily married. So, and I, at one point I said, I can't imagine being married again. So here I am with a wonderful husband. And so things change. And the other one... 
Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's very tricky. I was a single parent since my child was two. And I think, um, as a mother, we always feel absolutely torn in half. So when she was little, uh, she would come with me all the time. And uh, even our dogs. She was here 20 years ago. We were here with with Mother Venus and Mishpan Fabo. And and then as they get older, you know, they start to have a life. So you have to choose uh, things that, that are worth taking away from your child. But it's very true. She said to me once, um, Mommy, I want you. I want all of you. So, you know, it's impossible as a single working parent to always have your child have all of you. But that's all you want. It's all they want. So you're very torn all the time. There's no perfect solution to that, I don't think. I'm lucky to have a beautiful daughter who's understood our life, and um, I'm very blessed by her. Sí, adelante ahí, por favor. Sí. Buenas tardes. Uh, Hi, good afternoon. Two questions. Also, the first question: How, in the film, as Albert Nobbs, it's much easier to survive in Hollywood uh, at being a man, or is that not the case? Being a woman, an intelligent woman, is it? And the second question, whether you've uh, uh, finally abandoned the villains with this role as a good person in this case? Your well, I played was Cruella de Vil. <laughs> Who's truly the devil? I don't think of any of my other ca characters of, of, of villains. I think uh, some, many of them, um, the Marquis de Montoy and Paddy Hughes, they're women existing in a very male world. And I, I still believe that um, if it was a man playing that role, there would be no question that he wouldn't be, she, he wouldn't be called an evil or a manipulator. He would just be doing his job. Um, so, I'm sorry, what, what was the question? <coughs> Is it easy to survive in Hollywood being a woman, given the fact that Albert Nobbs and you, so and so? That's a very good question. Um, uh, I think I think it's probably a little easier to survive in Hollywood if you're a man. Um, there's there's you know, once you reach 33, 34 as a woman, it becomes much more problematic. And I don't think that really has changed. I think they're coming out of Hollywood, there's not that many great stories for, for middle-aged, older, strong women. Um, I, I think historically speaking, as a species, we still find it difficult to think of women in, in powerful roles. Um, I always think of Elizabeth I of England, who never allowed herself to get married, uh, even though she had kept saying that she was thinking about it, because I think she knew when she, when she got married, she would be giving over her power. So um, I, I, I do think it is problematic for women. I think I've been very blessed by the roles that I've been able to play. But I've always uh, been of the philosophy that if I don't get good roles, then I'd much rather try to create one or to create something that will bring actors together who will uh, be able to do what they do and have a great experience. It's uh, nice music. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Glenn. Uh, over here? Yeah. Oh, over here. Something. <laughs> uh, hi, a uh, great performance. Uh, it's one well, I think that everybody is thinking that it has an Oscar uh, uh, around it. I uh, like what you think about it again. And also, how did you uh, balance uh, with your work as uh, an actress in this film, also producing and writing? Did you enjoy every each part of it, uh, the whole? Thank you. I did. It was an amazing experience for me. It is surreal to be here today, knowing that we actually made Albert Knobs, because it took 15 years to make it. We came very close 10 years ago. We lost our you know, opportunity. Um, and for the last five years, I've been my head writer. And I loved it. I loved uh, working with John Bonville, who's a great Irish writer. 
who was a wonderful collaborator and worked with us during the filming as well because I don't know the idiom of Ireland. So I would write a scene and then I would call him up and say, John, you know, do you have a couple of wonderful words? Um, producing, uh, I produced a lot for television. This is the first feature film that I've been a producer on. Um, I can't imagine a better team. You will meet uh, Rodrigo, who is also a producer, and Julian, we have Bonnie Curtis as our fourth producer. It was a fantastic team. We never gave up the belief that somehow we would find the right people who would believe in this film and back us. And I'm very proud to say that not one penny came out of Hollywood. And many of the people who, who um, invested in this film have never invested in, in film before. And for that, it was very exciting for us. It was very exciting for us to introduce them into the world of film and what we do. And, um, and one of our investors is a, is a man who, uh, from Texas. <laughs> and uh, he had such a funny idea of what, of what actors and you know, what you do in a movie. He was so impressed by the professionalism, by the rigor, by the detail, uh, you know, by the talent that he saw in every single aspect of this movie. So for us, it, it was wonderful to be able to expose uh, someone to a, a world that he knew nothing about, he and his wife, and it was a, so for them it was a great journey as well. So are we ready for Hollywood to nominate you once again for the Oscar? It would be lovely to be nominated, yes. <laughs> It's been a long time. See, I will follow suit. Yes. Hello, this is um, It's a pleasure to have you here in San Sebastian. How was the experience of working with uh, a director as uh, Rodrigo Garcia? And also, how did you define your character, Albert Norris? Thank you so much. How did... What was the question? Repeat the name, How would you define? How would you define your character, Albert Nobbs? Okay. Yes. That's right. First Rodrigo, I had done his first and second movie with him, and I think he is an extraordinary director. I think he is a beautiful writer, and I think he has written beautiful parts for women. Um, I thought he was a perfect match for this material. Um, and how would I define Albert Norris? Um, I think this is a story about survival. And I think there are many people in this world who are invisible and disenfranchised um, and who have no rights. And I think that's the world that Albert lived in. And I think uh, what I think the power of the story is it's a very, in some ways, a simple linear story about a very specific character surviving in Victorian uh, Britain. Um, but I think it has huge resonance resonance uh, in in the world today. So I think I think it's a story that carries you know a lot a lot of importance as far as the issues that it brings up. Um, and the characters are incredibly complex. I, there are scenes that I, you know, I, I always was so excited to have the chance to play, for example, when they put on dresses, because it's a very complicated moment. <laughs> so to play a character like Albert, um, who is an innocent, who has... Who, who develops a dream? Um, there's something incredible, very compelling about characters like that. Hi, good morning. Uh, at the back here. Hi, good morning. Congratulations for the film and for the Donosti Award. I have two questions. You're a woman who's got a very long career and an enormous amount of talent as well, but there's also something in your personality that has contributed to keep you in the front line of the battle. What is that aspect of your personality that's maintained you in the, that's given you that long career, long career, and that's maintained you, on, maintained you on the front line? I'll ask you the second question in a moment. I like that. Uh, 
answer your question, I think um, I decided very early in my career that I would choose what I did for very um, you know, um, specific reasons that were very personal to me, if so, and, and that I would go with writing that I thought was good, and that um, I think it's very dangerous in, in this in this profession to choose things if you if, because you think it will make you a lot of money or because you'll get some reward. I think that's very dangerous to your job. I think you have to stay very connected to. Uh, your choices, and I also don't like to bore myself, so I like to choose things that I think will be challenging and will help me keep developing as an artist. And the other question is the inevitable. For the Oscars, Meryl Streep has been a woman in your generation, obviously. She's won all of the awards. What's your relationship with, with, with Meryl? And what, do you, and what do you talk about when the Oscars come around? Oscar season, so to speak. <laughs> Talk about with Meryl. <laughs> <laughs> Probably our children. <laughs> Meryl is not a close friend of mine. Um, she's not, you know, but um, I have huge respect for her. The only time we've worked together is in House of the Spirits, and uh, we had a wonderful time, and we had our children. Uh, but I, you know, I don't talk about Oscars. I'm very um, fatalistic. And through my whole career, I've never believed anything would happen until it actually happens. So we'll see. Uh, hi, congratulations for the Life Achievement Award. I have two okay. questions. One about the Oscars, unfortunately. And um, after the North American festival phase of the film, all the Oscar pundits in America are tipping you off as one of the front runners for this year's Oscar race. Um, you said that you've been nominated a long time ago, I think last time was 1989, and things have changed. You have to campaign for an Oscar uh, right now. You said you would like to talk about it because you're fatalistic. What's your stance on Oscar campaigning? And second question about the casting, um, Mia Vasikovska, a great actress. I think the actress that played the role originally in the stage play was Pippa Pier 3, mm -hmm. and she must have been the age back then of Mia Vasikovska now. Mm -hmm. Did you in any way decide about the casting of this film, or why did they choose someone of that age? Did you think of choosing someone closer to the age of the actress that's playing Albert Nobel in this version, or did you want to add another layer of complications to the relationship between both of them? Okay, that's a long two question. Um, the Oscar, what was the first one? <laughs> Excuse me, my brain is can I take any one question at a time? Um, the Oscar was about Oscars. What's your standing in Oscar campaigning? You, okay. Call us a good no, I mean, this is actually the truth. Um, making of this film, it was a dream for so long. And when we finally got together in Ireland, uh, we went to prep in November, we started filming in December. I could not believe, uh, after all these years, that we could have had a better uh, group of people. It was phenomenal. Um, it was a great, you know, a great experience making it. Um, and I felt at the end that we made the movie that we wanted to make. And now the next, it was like handing a baton over to our to roadside attractions. And it's their job now to present the movie and to, you know, to, to have the, whatever campaigns it will be. Um, because I'm part of this team, I will, I will, you know, basically do what they ask me. Um, but I, I'm putting my trust in them. You know, I'm, I'm, I feel that we did our job and now it's, it's up to them. They're, they're extremely good. And I have great confidence that they'll, that they'll you know, uh, present our movie well. Um, and the second question. Casting. Casting is a great story. Um, uh, Mia was, well, Mia, the, the original for that role, um, uh, Mia came because, in the last minute, because she had worked with uh, Rodrigo. Rodrigo discovered Mia, brought her from Australia to, to do in treatment. And she loves Rodrigo. 
and she said she would do it without even reading the script. Um, I think as far as the age difference is concerned, I mean, I'm 20 years older now than I was when I originally played it, and I had to prove to myself that I still that it was okay when we did a, a screen test three years ago in order to say, okay, it's possible. And it would be, you know, I think Albert's age, I mean, everybody knows how old I am, so that's, you know, a little bit of a disadvantage. But we were hoping that Albert would be, you know, look like she's in the late 40s or early 50s. And she has, she has no concept of sexuality or, or love or anything like that. So I think she, um, any age would be okay for, for him. And I think that Albert is looking for somebody to, to be in the front of her, of her tobacco shop and to be a partner in her, in her business and her life. But I don't think she thinks of it as a sexual thing. So I think, I mean, it is complex, but I think it's, that's what I was thinking. Sí. Quisiera preguntarle por la relación del guión con la historia original de It's Van Sabo. ¿Existiría acaso alguna conexión entre Albert Knox y cintas del director como Mephisto y Encuentro con Venus, en donde usted mismo participó? En lo personal veo una estrecha conexión y parentesco con el tema del doble y la máscara. Yes, I would like to ask you about the relationship of the script with the original script written by Isman Sabon. Is there any connection between Albert Knobs and the director like Mephisto and the encounter with a meeting with Venus or encounter with Venus in the personal aspect? Is there any apparent relationship like the double and the mask by Fellini? By Fellini? I spent many years taking this story to many of my friends and many of the directors that I worked with. And um, for one reason or another, you know, some of the people were busy, some people didn't just, you know, get it. But when I worked to do that meeting Venus with Ishvan and I gave him this story, he said, I understand this. He said, I've lived under, you know, various regimes in my life in Hungary and we have a different face for each one. So he thought of the story in a political context and he said it's about survival and the kind of faces that people put on in order to survive. And he actually asked me if he could write the treatment and he did. And um, at that point he was going to direct it. Uh, his translator, Gabriel Prekop, was the one who first made it into a script. And I worked very hard for a number of years to try to sell it, and uh, I couldn't. And then after working with uh, Rodrigo, I thought maybe you know, this would be the, 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 the way to go, and I called up Ishvan. It was a very difficult phone call, because he's a great friend of mine. And I said I could have difficulty, because I, they thought he would make a certain kind of movie, and um, it was hard for people to kind of put the two together. Um, and he was very, very gracious and said, I understand, I love this. If that's the way you want to go, I, I support you 100%. And uh, I think he's very excited to still be a part of it with his name and his credit. And uh, he's very much, a, he will always be a, an important part of this movie. Um. Hi, good morning. Two questions, but easy questions, okay. <laughs> Being with Rodrigo, that, that, this is a link with Latin America and Colombia, it says, so and what does it mean to you to receive the Donosia Career Award that you're going to receive? Uh, he's talking about Rodrigo and that link with Latin America and Colombia. Uh, what's, what's that all that about, really? The Donosia Award? The question is a little unclear. La, la, no, la, la the question is, working with Rodrigo, he's Colombian, albeit he's been brought up, what has it meant for you? Whether, what, have you gotten closer to the Colombian um, culture? Have you read anything about uh, Colombian, uh, with Colombian writers? And then the, question, the second question is, what does it mean to you to receive the Donostia Career Award? Okay. The wonderful uh, literature that, that is Rodrigo's father. <laughs> Gabriel Garcia Marquez, one of the great, great writers, living writers. Um, and uh, 
I suppose it's through through his writing that I've that I've gotten my, whatever knowledge I have of, of that culture. Um, and I am incredibly fond of Rodrigo, and I think we had an extraordinary collaboration making this film. Um, there was at one point in the, in the script more more kind of imagination in Albert's head that you saw that was like the magic realism that you see in a lot of the South American film. So I thought that he would be, you know, again, he would understand the light touch and the humor um, that's needed. Um, and as far as the last year award, I'm incredibly moved by it because, um, you know, when you start out in a career like this, you never know where your next job is coming from. And you make your choices um, sometimes, as, as I said, for very personal reasons. And uh, when all of a sudden you come to a point in your career where you actually have a body of work. But it's not as if you've had great wisdom uh, every single time about what you've done. You only hope that you could stay true to, to yourself and, um, and, and not compromise as far as, as the material that you choose to do. So to be honored for something um, that is, is as fragile, if you think, perhaps, as the life of an actor is, is a, a huge, it's, a, it's, it's incredibly humbling to me and um, I'm incredibly grateful to be, to be recognized in this way, especially at, at, a, at a film festival like this that is, is so distinguished and represents the, the world. It's a very big moment for me. You have a very warm vo voice now, and you, and Albert has, and uh, you. But your voice in Sunset Boulevard, the best Norma Desmond that you've seen, that I've ever seen in Sunset Boulevard. I would like to know, in at a given moment in San Sebastian, can you sing a song from Sunset Boulevard at a given moment? Because you've got a lovely voice. Once upon a time, not long ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny because we, uh, in our long journey to get money for this movie, we found ourselves down in Dallas, Texas, at a dinner um, at the aunt and uncle, ha at the, the house of the aunt and uncle of Bonnie Curtis, is one of our, our producers. And there were two tables. There were, I think, six couples wealthy people who knew that they were going to be asked for money and Bonnie had asked me beforehand do you think you would sing you could sing for them and I thought oh you know that's a that's a new idea as far as a little dinner like this but I thought well um okay <laughs> I could do it so I had my the man who conducted Sunset like Boulevard come down and after the dinner and we had talked to them all about our movie I got up and I said, the only way I can thank you, and I hope that you'll come along on this journey with us, is to do what I do. And I, I sang a song from Sunset Boulevard. And I think because the room was so small and my voice was so loud that they decided that they, you know, they would come with us and give us some money. <laughs> so, so, Rodrigo and Julie, in? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. The director, Rodrigo Garcia, the producer, Julie Lin, have just come into the press conference, by the way. Next question, please. So many movies, uh, after doing great dramas, great comedies, great TV dramas, what does it make you still get about all this? What does it what? What is what does it make you think about the industry? Oh. Um, it's very hard to say. Um, to have the opportunity to, to tell stories that I'm fascinated by, um, I think I think that's 
what he's basically about. I think as an actor, I want to tell stories that connect emotionally to people and will give you some sort of an experience. Um, and I think the power of of stage, of television, of, of film, you have the potential to do that, to, to, to keep reminding uh, ourselves of what it means to be a human being. I think Albert Nobbs is, is about uh, everyone needing to feel safe and to feel connected to another human being. I think we, that's what we need, and if you're lucky to have work that you can be proud of, but to be connected and to feel and be safe is very basic to, to what humans need. And that's a story that I've always believed in. From Argentina, this is a question in dangerous liaisons you used the corset, which made you more buxom and Albert Nobbs you used another corset, but but it had to hide what you have there. Can you reflect upon both corsets or both both characters? And what was the mo the most difficult of both the characters? And what have they left in you, both of those characters that you portrayed? The, 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 the corset. No, yeah, the corset is fantastic. I spent a lot of time in my professional life in corset. Um, Cruella had a very she had the cruelest corset of all. Um, the, the Marquis, I was, it was, uh, I was lucky. I'd just given birth to my daughter seven weeks before I went to Paris. So I had very big breasts and needed that corset. It was also part of the, the costume of the time. Um, I always love uh, corsets because it dictates how you move. And for the Marquis, uh, who had that, that uh, the corset, it's uh, just, it helps you know how to stand and, and, and move. And with Albert, it was the same thing. I mean, she was more, it was more like a bandage, you know, more like a, a cage, I think, um, for Albert. But it also uh, informed my, my posture and kind of played into the fact that she was a very formal servant and... Uh, you know, she just gotten she gotten so used to it it was like second nature to her. But I, I like the image at the end when the doctor is unwrapping her. It is like unwrapping some sort of wound that is, you know, to be a woman and to be it was as, as if your breasts are, are a liability, you know. And uh, this was you know, something that had kept her from being who she you know, who she was and was finally at the end, you know, he he unwraps. I like that image very much. But the, uh, the Marquis is all about you know, sexuality. Uh, Albert was the opposite. Hello there. Um, Rodrigo Garcia was here. It's very sensitive towards a woman and motherhood, as we can see in his wonderful movie, A Mother and Child. And I wanted to know if you would read and if, you, if this is one of the reasons why you admire him as a director and as a human being. I, I, I can, every time I hear a question like this, I can hear my wife laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's the image I see of you. <laughs> um, it's a two, it's a two way street, you know, I think, um, Yes, he, d he, he does have wonderful sensitivity to him. He's also a wonderful director. Yeah. You, you, you have to have both. <laughs> what are your comments? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I like women, obviously, and I, you know, I like, uh, I like their worlds as I imagine them. You know, obviously, I'm, I'm not a woman, so I, you know, my point of departure is what is common between what I feel is common between them and me. Um, and, and then the imagination. For me, it's exotic. It's my way of going somewhere. You know, some directors need to go to big, you know, foreign locales or travel in time or whatever. You know, for me, just the, the trip from my head to the head of, of, of a woman is a, is a fantastic trip. It's, you know, 
that's that exercise of imagination and you know both imagining the other and connecting with the other. Two questions. Two years ago, you came with a mother and child and nine lives and interlinked lives. Have you abandoned that type of film format? That's one question. Another question. Mother and child, you came out of competition. Now you're repeating again out of the competition. When are you going to compete for the Golden Seashell? The truth is the projects that I have now aren't multiple stories. They're more focused upon one single story and one single character. As regards to come and to come here in, in competition, it's a bit more relaxed to come and not participate in the competition and to come and it's much more comfortable to have a good time, to promote the film and to not have to be... I always say, well, you're always being judged. You're always judged in one way or another you're, and your work. But always with the option of being in the competition or not competition, I'm glad to be here outside the competition. Okay. What do you think of my English? Damn good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Glenn, over here. Here, uh, here we are playing uh, a woman in, in, in a man, in, in, a woman in the same role. Uh, I wonder how, how um, different is it to, to be an actress and uh, producer and director in a man's role as uh, Hollywood and, and in, the, in the film world. Do you feel that it's still difficult to be, uh, to struggle in that world? Hmm. Um, let's see. As a woman. morning, I have a question for Ms. Close and also a question for Rodrigo for first. I'll ask one question and then the other. Okay. Rodrigo, taking advantage of the opportunity that you've got Glenn Close with you and bearing in mind that she wrote the script, she produced the film, how was it, and be sincere please, how was it to work on the set with Ms. Close? Is she a bit of a control freak or what's the situation? Or did you give her a lot of freedom to act? <laughs> well, what is imp what's important always in a project of this nature is to know what project you're going to make and uh, film you're going to make. So then when we came on set, we spent a long time. First of all, I'd already worked with Glenn a couple of times beforehand. So therefore, I know what type of actress she is, what type of person she is, what type of collaborator she is. And so therefore, also, because of this, I wanted to do the project because, first of all, it was her dream, a dream of hers, and I'm very proud that she offered it to me, by the way, and secondly, because I know that she's a woman 
who collaborates uh, that you can who collaborates a lot and you can work with it very easily. It's true. I wouldn't do make any sort of any kind of film whether my director is my my actor is my scriptwriter. No, but. But with Glenn, I, I knew I could do this, and I know she's a very inclusive person and who's always prepared to discuss every single uh, creative aspect of the film. And the truth is that things went well. It was, it was incredible for me. It was, a, it was a difficult adjustment for me as an actor, mainly, because... Um, you know, we had talked about the script, we had you know, developed the script up to the moment of shooting, we had been in rehearsals, and that whole process kept going, we had about 10 days of rehearsals before we started. Um, but then I found myself when I was on the, on the set, I have traditionally been very, um, what is the word, uh, you know, it's the director that has the absolute say, and, and um, to speak up um, was a hard, hard for me to do. Um, we worked very, very fast because of our budget, and I made the first time that I, that I thought I had to say something because uh, I had a question about how, you know, I think it was how someone was you know, blocked or something. I, it, it, I, it, I did this in front of the crew, which I don't like to do, and I felt, I felt like throwing up afterwards because I thought I would undermine Rodrigo even though I tried to be, you know, it, and, and it was very uncomfortable. But then um, we had this amazing collaboration. I, I feel that even though I've lived with this for so long and I have very strong ideas that like anything else, you have to gain people's trust in your ideas. You, you don't put, you know, put your ideas, you know, demand that that's the only way it's been done. You have to, we have, you know, we have incredibly talented people who put a lot of thought in what they were doing. So it's how you present your idea and then how open you remain. But if your idea is a good one, they'll go with it. But it's not something you can demand. And the more you have a good idea that everybody says, oh, that's a good idea, the more they are open to your idea. So it's, it's um, I, I, I never took for granted that, that it, you know, if it was my demand, I never, you know, it was like, um, you have to, I, early on in my career, my first job, I was a understudy. And um, it was a very good way to begin, even though I was miserable because all I wanted to do was be up on stage. But I was able to observe the, the um, chemistry between the director and between the various actors and how he would sometimes, he would always listen to Sam and he'd look at his watch for others. And I, and I observed that if you don't think something's right, uh, it's not very um, productive to just say, you know, I don't feel good. This is, doesn't seem right to me. But you, you have to come up with an alternative. And it's better if you come up with three alternatives. Um, and so, in, in many ways, I think that's the way I think, well, I think that's what a collaboration is. You, you throw out an idea, you talk about it, and then if it's a good idea, um, because you're all on the same level with people who come along with it. My following question is for you, Miss Close. And Albert was pursuing you and occupying your feelings for almost 30 years, is that correct? What's the next thing you're going to do? What, what continues to move you? Uh, what moves those uh, emotional fibers of yours? To finish, uh, I have another uh, season of damages uh, that, I, that I will do. Um, and after that, I don't know. I have no idea what I'm going to do next. I mean, I would like, I, um, I would love to try to write something again, but this time starting with the blank page. I don't know if I can do that, but I have uh, an idea I'd like to, to work on, and, and that would be challenging to me. So maybe that's my next challenge, is to try to write something from scratch. <laughs> Another question related to the most idealist side of actors. I think there's nothing worse in the world that you can't show than, than to show one as one is. 
Albert Nobbs, to one aspect, that there's a bit of a complicity to all of those people in the world that continue to be oppressed in this aspect and they can't demonstrate themselves as they really are. Is there a wink in Albert Nobbs in a given moment that make winks to those people that are still oppressed and can't show themselves as they really are? A wink? Um, a translation. Nod, like, like, yeah. a, a nod, yes. Is there a nod? Yes. Oh, absolutely. I, 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 I think... Um, I, I think... I, I, I know that there are people who live with big secrets and aren't able to be who they are. Yeah, they're in this room right now. <laughs> I mean, I, I, for once, the whole population of people with a lot of people with mental illness. Um, I started a, 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 an organization with a stigma around mental illness because I have mental illness in my family. And I know what that means. And so, I mean, that population alone, one in four people in the world are affected by mental illness. One in four people. You know, there's a considerable amount of you here who have done that, but it's still something that people feel obligated to hide for the most part. Um, and for, for many, many years, uh, people who are gay, the, the, that whole community had to hide. Um, and I think that in our country, that's getting a little better, but um, the same thing. Uh, and those are, I mean, those are just two cases, but... but we go out of the, our door every day, and whether you have a major something to hide or something, you know, little, we, we just rearrange our face every day to meet the world. And any given moment, you're not really saying what you really think, I mean, for the most part. So I think everyone has a little bit of Albert in them. Um, and it's just a question of, of degrees and whether you can live with it or not. And I think the, at the end of the movie when the doctor, when you hear that the doctor moved away because he couldn't stand secrets anymore, I think this world would probably be a better place if more people looked at themselves in the mirror and said, I need to let my secret go. Okay, this will be the last question. Let's go. So, uh, to both of you, I want to congratulate you, first of all, for the film. I think it was a great defense of feminism, but it's up, it's brought about a question as well at the end of the film, or middle, through the film, the couple can be two women at the same time. This is like some insects that have double sex, uh, double sex insects. So therefore this creates, that, this brings about that question, that is thing. what role does a man play that in this film is a sort of, is, is like, is like a, a, a bee stuck in a, in a beehive, what role does man play in life? I don't know. Well, well, there will always be men. <laughs> All of a sudden, we make the joke that in the future, the women will be able to choose their sperm and a sperm bank and so on and so forth. But I think, to whatever, there are many men, there are good men, and women like uh, men a lot. I don't think we're going to disappear. I don't believe this at all. I think that are we going to continue? In, in the film, you're showing the contrary. Well, the film, there are also good men. The doctor obviously has a secret life. The, Joe's character, who played by Aaron Johnson, he's a person which is, is quite conflictive. He's a, he's a survivor and he wants to make some money off Albert. And on the other hand, he's a person who wants to learn who wants to his ambition he knows that he comes from a very from a violent family background and I think that he's a person who can also exceed in life uh, I think that feminism uh, masculinism th these are labels obviously these are good but th there's both sides I think both sides have to exist and to survive to survive because otherwise it's, it'd be impossible is that hopefully people will take away from this movie is that gender should be irrelevant. Um, there, you know, obviously there are men and there are women, but uh, what's more important is the connection between human beings no matter who they are and, uh, and whatever the, where, wherever their love is. I, but I do think that sometimes when there are some scenes in this movie where you forget what you're looking at. Because
because it's a little bit complex. And for example, Hubert and Kathleen could be a man and a woman. They happen to be two women, but it could, they could be a man and a woman. And I, and I like that kind of com, com, complexity, but I also think ultimately that you know, in an enlightened world, gender is irrelevant. Thank you very much. Oscar Gascón, muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you.